Superintendent McLaughlin heard about the pictures, he tried to persuade White that the inclusion of the images was unnecessary and inappropriate. The dissemination of pictures depicting Grand Canyon tarnished by plane wreckage was not the sort of publicity the Park Service relished. Surprisingly, it was a daring solo voyage, not a commercial river party, which sparked the biggest controversy. After surveying the crash sites from the air in July 1957, Phoenix resident Robert Billingsley constructed a crude raft from two, two rubber inner, inner tubes and floated down the Colorado. This, by the way, almost got him killed. But. <clears throat> During this adventure, Billingsley spent July 20th at the United site and the next day at, T at the TWA wreckage, where he claimed to have found a large amount of human remains. Although he later denied accusations of treasure hunting, Billingsley collected coins, other personal items, and most disturbingly, two wedding rings from a hand he discovered. Billingsley related his adventure to Phoenix radio reporter Bill Close, after which it became front page news in many Arizona newspapers. The unwanted publicity of these incidents, much of it centered around Billingsley's claims regarding unburied bodies, convinced both the airlines and the Park Service to attempt a cleanup of the area. In September 1957, park rangers attempted to conceal wreckage that was visible from the river. Large aircraft fragments were cut into pieces and concealed behind boulders or otherwise buried. Pieces of the plane thought to have drawn Billingsley into the TWA impact area were obscured. Although the amount of human remains was far less than what Billingsley reported, the crew did find some remains that were buried nearby with the permission of Coconino County Attorney. The workers located the large TWA tail section a quarter mile from the impact site on the side of a steep ravine and pushed it into a gully where it could not be seen by river travelers. So this is the, the large tail section that was came off pretty much intact and fell near the uh, main impact site. With the wreckage hidden from view, the confluence was reopened to public use on September 20th, 1957, although the wreckage itself remained off limits to visitors. As tourist activity on the Colorado River continued to increase, along with backcountry use, the measures taken to conceal the wreckage in 19 1957 proved inadequate. Tourists continued to visit and loot the site. And so here we have a couple uh, pictures of river runners visiting the site. Um, so although the 57 cleanup sort of obscured a lot of the wreckage uh, that could be seen from the river, as you can see, um, you know, once you got into that area, there was still a ton of, of debris. And here are a couple examples of items that have been looted from the site. Um, I actually just got confirmation from Mike McComb, who's done a lot of research on this crash. Uh, he was just down in Tucson on Monday uh, to identify these items. They were suspected to have been from the crash. Um, they were donated to the Arizona Historical Society in 1967 uh, anonymously. But this is just sort of an example of the sorts of things that people were taking from the crash site. So um, the top photo is a pilot control wheel. Um, you can't see it in this photo, but the back of it is actually a chard um, from the fires at the site. And then also here's another example, a flight crew earphone. The growth of air tourism was another concern. Despite the cleanup in 19, 1957, large amounts of debris were visible from the air, which you, which you can kind of see here. This is the United site. Um, and from the air, you know, shiny aluminum, it's pretty easy to see. Between 1957 and 1976, rapidly increasing visitation at Grand Canyon brought more visitors into contact with the remains of the disaster. The popularization of backcountry hiking meant that visitors traveled along the Colorado Visitors traveling along the Colorado River were given excellent views of the crash site, especially the United Wreckage. The proliferation of scenic air tours meant the wreckage, although concealed from the river, was now visible overhead. Finally, by the end of the 1960s, 
The trickle, trigger, trickle of river, river travelers floating down the Colorado River had become a flood of rafting neophytes, many of whom stumbled across or sought out pieces of the plains. The 20th anniversary of the disaster also highlighted interest in the crash sites. As early as 1970, Grand Canyon began, began receiving requests to visit and photograph the wreckage. In June 1976, Superintendent uh, Merrill Stitt received more inquiries from newspaper, radio, and television reporters. Several months later, NBC ran a three-part feature on air traffic control, which included an entire segment on the 56 crash. By 1976, Tourists, refer referred to in NPS memos as sensation seekers, were being routine routinely cited in the area. The desire to visit the crash sites was so widespread that administrators felt resource, resource damage was inevitable. Passive protection, hiding and concealing wreckage was no longer viable. Drastic action was needed. Although the park had decided removal of the wreckage was the best option, they needed the airlines to foot the, foot the bill. Superintendent uh, Stitt express, expressed his view to the airlines bluntly, arguing that, quote, the wreckage constitutes an unnatural intrusion by man, not too far from that concept of trash, end quote. Proposed cleanup was compared with the removal of other debris below the rim, like automobiles. MPS director, regional director, Lyle McDowell, McDowell also described the wreckage as litter and agreed with Stitt that the plane should be removed to maintain the natural feel of the area and the quality of visitor experience. Stitt likened the cleanup proposal to Grand Canyon's policy of, quote, pack it in, pack it out for hikers, and suggested that the airlines owed it to the public to, quote, clean up their litter, end quote. Although the superintendent's remarks seem somewhat callous in retrospect, there was strong public support to clean up the park and a general campaign to restore its wilderness, wilderness character. So really, the, the cleanup in 76 is part of a broader uh, effort, I guess, to sort of, uh, yeah, restore the wilderness character of the park. In fact, it was, I think it was around 1976 is when the first management plan for the Colorado River went into effect. Uh, which also had to do with cleaning up a lot of debris that um, had been caused by uh, overuse by river runners in the area. So. In October 1976, a salvage firm used helicopters to remove the majority of the debris from the canyon. The largest pieces were slung out by helicopter, after which the smaller fragments were racked, raked into large containers and flown to the north rim. It also appears the salvage team raked soil and other rock over the blackened earth in concentration of small fragments at the main impact sites. The salvage team made over 70 trips into the canyon and removed approximately 20,000 to 30,000 pounds of aluminum. They dumped much of this wreckage on the Navajo Nation land and then trucked the salvageable material to Page, Arizona, where it was sold for scrap. The salvage team buried the unsalvage unsalvageable wreckage on the rim with the permission of the Navajo Nation. A few personal items found at the United site, along with a small amount of human bone, was turned over to <coughs> the county coroner. By the, by the end of the month, the operation was complete. So here you can just see, um, on the, the top photo here is a picture of the United site. Um, you see the helicopter they, they used to sort of sling out a lot of the wreckage. Um, and it does appear that they sort of kicked down a lot of soil over the, over the blackened part of the impact area to sort of naturalize things. <clears throat> when we did the survey in 2008, that was kind of apparent. There was a lot of loose rock and dirt that was over the main impact area. As these pictures show, the 1976 cleanup drastically reduced the visibility of the crash sites and the appeal of the area for tourists. Despite the, ex the extensive cleanups designed to limit visitation, the amount of tourists, the flow of tourists into the crash sites never ceased completely. The drainage which leads up to Temple Butte 
which is a TWA site, is known as crash 